let's talk about the metaverse fashion in Decentraland. It was a flop. Why would you go into Decentraland? And why would you go into any of these platforms for Metaverse Fashion Week? What is it? Is there something for you to gain? People do things because they're incentivized and they're they're gaining some value from it. And at this point, there's really no value, if we're going to be honest. But I think that the evolution of fashion will become digital and physical, and we won't call it Metaverse Fashion Week. It'll just be, you know, fashion brands creating physical and digital at the same time experiences. Alejandro, we are back on the NFT Now podcast. Who do we have on today? Uh, today, we have Megan Casper. She is an incredible OG investor, someone who has been in, in the space in crypto since 2011. Um, and she has been most notable uh, as a founder of RedDAO and being a champion for Web3 fashion and digital fashion as the most recent. What are you excited about today's episode? Yeah, look, I think that we have identified digital fashion as an incredibly exciting vertical and area for potential mainstream adoption of this technology. So many big brands coming into the space. I don't think there's anyone more knowledgeable about this area than Megan. So I'm very excited to hear her perspective on this and other emerging technologies. I think she she invests from a place of real insight and innovation. And I'm very excited to hear about her approach. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm super bullish on who she is as an investor. And I'm just eager to find out what that thought process is like from her perspective, what she sees in the space and what the patterns that she looks for in founders before she invests. Uh, but before we go into the episode, remember, our newsletter comes out every Friday. Go to nftnow.com, register, sign up, and you'll get some great alpha, bite-sized news. And from time to time, you may hear directly from the founders. You never know. Um, but without further ado... Who do we have on today? Megan Casper. Megan Casper, so excited to have you on the NFT Now podcast. How are you doing? Wonderful. Thank you guys for having me. So right. it's such a beautiful day in New York. This is, a, this is a beautiful day, and this is also a day that's been a long time coming, right? A very long time coming. I feel like we have a living legend in the space. And so I'm just incredibly grateful that, that you're here because like, many people don't know this, but a lot of our community walks on the ground that you help pave. Um, and you, like you are definitely the definition of trailblazer. And I'm just so excited to dive into it later today in the episode. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a fun ride. <laughs> Truly. And, and it's been a long ride, right? Like you, you're an OG in the space. A lot of people don't know that you've been you've been in crypto like for she, a long she's time. She's not an OG. She is the definition. <laughs> she is, she's not, she hey, is hey, the OG, hey. not an OG. She <laughs> is the OG. Why don't you just give us brief background on, on just how you got into crypto, NFTs and Web3? Well, before NFTs even existed, uh, a family member called me in 2011 and said, hey, I'm mining this thing called Bitcoin. Send me some money. We'll go in 50-50 on a mining project. And um, I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. This sounds crazy. I'm not interested. Uh, and this individual was uh, very deep into gaming and early internet currencies and constantly just pouring money into those spaces and losing it. So like, <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone yeah, yeah, does. 50-50, yeah, yeah, yeah. so like, you're like, yeah. Ah. You can't, yeah, I'm, I was like, you know, I'm out. Count me out on this one. And he said, well, I'm going to send you the Bitcoin white paper, so just read it. And I read the Bitcoin white paper, and I didn't understand all of it on the first reading. Who and does? Like, I, like, like, who did? Yeah, right, right, right. I didn't. I understood parts. There were a lot of parts that resonated with me and things that I understood about our traditional economic system um, and things that I could see being disrupted. But then as I read it, I was so skeptical because I thought, well, whoever created this, I, I just thought it was a scam. I'm like, this is, this is a very well thought out, very well put down scam. Um, and, you know, I, I don't really know what to do with this information. And over the course of a year and a half, I read it multiple times. I was working for a family office and they came to me and said, you know, we'd really like to start investing in different tech opportunities outside of our traditional, um, out, like where we're allocating capital. So I immediately looked up and said, well, there's this thing called Bitcoin and I've read the white paper. Maybe we should do a deep dive. And later that day, we sat in um, the, the 
boardroom and just went deep dive on the whiteboard on Bitcoin, the Bitcoin white paper. And it was my mission to go out and learn more about the space and the people that were working in the space. And I found a group of people in Santa Monica, California, that's where I was at the time, um, and Brock Pierce was leading them. This just this massive group, of, not massive at the time. It was maybe like twenty people. But that was but massive it, back it then. Was right? like, that was a lot. That yeah. was a lot. Like, yeah. It was, and um, you know, he would just corral everyone at this little spot on Ocean uh, once a week, and everyone would talk, people would come from San Francisco, and you would get you know Roger Varen and just a lot of early people um, meeting and talking about the technology. So that's really where I built my foundation of education and learning about how Bitcoin can free us or disrupt us um, from our current system now. And with my foundational like understanding of the technology over the course of, of three or four years, I just knew I would spend the rest of my career in this space. And um, it was around the time that I started to think about how to solve problems in the world. Um, when you're in college, you think like, you know, how can I make the world a better place? And what are things that I can do? Or where can I focus my time? So I would have these thoughts while I was driving. And when I found Bitcoin, it was like, wow, this can be a place where, because I always traditionally just thought that, you know, a lot of the world's issues stemmed from us not being able to have the truth of data and facts. And a lot of, um, you know, education, like there are different belief systems that people have. And I think, you know, if, if we had this true and transparent place where everyone could go about to see numbers or fa facts or data, um, that would be really helpful. So it made a lot of sense uh, when I found Bitcoin and I got very excited. And then I started to think about other use cases. And around 2015, um, after the Ethereum crowd sale, I started to see where um, non-fungible on-chain you know, smart contracts and an intelligence layer on the blockchain would give us the capability to have digital fashion. And that all sort of stemmed from the gaming background of a lot of people that were around me and my exposure to gaming assets and skins and the secondary market. And I started to conceptualize these ideas around, you know, the disruption of our handheld device to a near eye wearable and how once we get there, we're going to be able to interact with data in real time and have an overlay of Digital, many things, you know, but digital fashion to me was the most exciting. And then I started to think, well, it's just like skins. You can't really authenticate them, but you could if they're on a blockchain. So um, very, very exciting. And then uh, I'll never forget, I was in my office one day and um, we had Evan Vandenberg working, working at the office and he came in and he said, the artifact guys want to meet with us. And I said, I have no idea who those who yeah, that is. And he's like, well, crew, you know, yeah. Chris Lee, who at the time was was making skins for um, many different companies, and uh, it there were a few people in our in our uh, group that were friends with him, and said, you know, Chris Lee and Stephen, they're all getting together in Benoit to create Artifact, and they gave us they walked us through the deck, and it was amazing, and they hadn't taken it to anyone else. Um, we were the first person, first group to see it. And it was so exciting. And I knew right away, this was the moment in time where the younger generation gets it too. And we're going to see a proliferation of a lot of founders and creators building in digital fashion. And so it became one of the five main, um, areas that I focus on as an investor in the space. No, that's amazing. And you're very, you're incredibly humble first and foremost, because you have seen a significant, um, I want to say portion of a lot of deal flow, mm -hmm. right? You see, uh, you've seen a lot of companies, both successful and not successful, you know, from 2011, you've probably over, you've already, this is what your fourth bear market, fifth mm -hmm. bear market at this point, <laughs> like you're probably like, you know, like, like thick skin in the game, but you've also been incredibly successful at picking out successful companies and founders and you've had some great returns on this um what is it that you find or what you look for in founders in blockchain and web3 companies that are like what's that pattern recognition what are some of the traits that that you look for for founders when you invest like for example benoit chris and steven what was it about them that you're like hey 
they've got it versus they're a little crazy, right? <laughs> like, you know, there's a fine line yeah. between they've got it and what the fuck are they talking about? <laughs> so like, so it's a bit of both, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what is that in that pattern recognition that you find and what's that gift that you have? It's, I think it's more about being able to attract or magnetize people that can see almost like the future or that are visionaries to build the future. And I see it in you. When I met you, it was, it was immediate. I'm like, you know, you have, there's this energy, the energy that Steven has, I mean, all Benoit and Chris Lee, they're great too. And, but Steven, when I met him, I was like, oh, that this is it. He's the visionary. He really is the one who's, you know, leading and guiding this mission. And I think with every company, you sort of have that, but you need all the other pieces. It's really important. And if you have the visionary and the visionary doesn't have the other parts and pieces for the machine, I mean, they're all equal. Um, it doesn't work. And it's a, it's a super nuanced thing. And it's also very difficult to find, but when you do, you just know it. And once or twice a year, I'm lucky enough because I'm a super curious person to find incredible people who are building amazing projects and I can invest and help them grow and build. I think one of the things that I'm really amazed by, Matt, it's like Megan is consistently not only driven by her curiosity, but you are an abundance of both kindness and opportunities. Like I've seen in Paris, uh, through Red Dow, through everything, like I've, every group that we're part of, you are consistently creating opportunities for other people, even people that you don't even know, mm -hmm. right? You're like, hey, when people are looking for things, you're like, yeah, got you, connect you, boom, what is it that you need? It's that abundance mindset. That yeah. is abundance mindset. So yeah. like, hey, what does that come from? It comes from people doing that for me to be honest mm. with you. So in 2011 and 2012, Brock, I talk a lot about him. Even though he can be a controversial figure in the space, he really was a very um, important figure because he brought to keep what he did. I watched and it was so powerful. And it was just giving this energy that birthed a lot into the space. Um, and there were many people around him that did that too. And I was just very fortunate to be surrounded and embraced by all of those people. So I know what that looks like. And because I know what that looks like, I want to be a, a sort of an usher and a guide and a leader in doing that with this iteration um, because I can, because people taught me and now I can give that back. And it's just, it's an incredibly amazing experience to, to watch. I absolutely love that. And, you know, that energy really shines through. And, and you know, we actually recently, uh, obviously, you're an honoree on the NFT 100, but we also did a, a, uh, a like a dedicated spotlight um, on you, like a feature um, to showcase, you know, just what we think is an incredibly important emerging category of digital fashion, which you've been at the forefront of. I know you're very passionate about the future. Um, and you spoke in that, uh, in that interview very articulately to a, a few of these, like, use cases around digital fashion. I know there are many, um, but I, I would love to just, you know, Know, I would love to just inform our audience, you know, um, what are some of the most exciting ones and the ones that are really top of mind for you as you continue to really champion um, the future of this field? Well, the most exciting for me, and I've talked about it for years, is augmented reality. Um, I'm really excited about the use cases of what augmented reality will do for us and the sustainability that it'll bring for the world. Um, I love fashion. I'm a very big consumer of fashion. Um, since I was a little girl, I would take the covers of Vogue and very nicely take, you know, cut them off and all of the editorials and I would paste, put them up on my wall perfectly. And it was just this beautiful wall of high end designer luxury fashion. And as I become older and I've started to collect these assets, I realize, you know, wow, every human, like there are a lot of people that have massive amounts of, of clothing that they don't wear. There's about 30%, they say, of the American wardrobe that gets purchased and never worn. Um, so it's one of the, it's the fourth most polluting industries in the world. There's third world countries that have piles and mountains of clothing. Um, we don't think about it because we live in this disposable society that just allows us to get things on demand and just, you know, toss them out when we don't need them and we don't see it out of sight, out of mind. And um, we don't really see what happens from start to finish with a, with a product. And I think that digital fashion, and that just, you know, it sort of breaks my heart because 
I, I don't want to contribute to the pollution and the destruction of our planet. And I don't think anyone else does either. But at the same time, we all want to, you know, look and feel our best and wear cool things and express ourselves in fun and interesting ways. And digital fashion allows us to do that in a really impactful way, in a positive way. So that's the most exciting use case is AR for me. Um, and I think, you know, we'll go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but um, I have- I love the rabbit hole. Okay. Um, maybe we'll get to brain computer interfaces, but before- Ooh, We're definitely bef- going to go there. Before we're we get there, there. Um, I've had a theory and, you know, just like in 2012, 2013, 2014, when I was deep into crypto- Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> Not financial advice, but do your own research. Yeah, never, <laughs> never financial advice. Um, but- uh, in you know er, my early days um, of crypto, everyone made fun of me, and they told me, you know, this is crazy. This is you know, you need to get a real job and focus on real things. And same thing with with digital fashion. I I've you know sort of told my vision for what I see, it, and it's that we'll all be wearing solid color, maybe some sort of tight fitting or form fitting outfits um, that give us in real time biofeedback and information about what's going on in our bodies um, so that we're able to optimize how we're uh, interacting in physical society. But at the same time, we'll be able to accessorize ourselves with AR, um, whether that's through a near eye wearable or again, maybe a brain computer interface. Um, It's really interesting. When people think about brain computer interfaces, uh, they think about Elon Musk's um, Neuralink. Neuralink yeah. yeah. And the problem with most people don't know this, so I'll share a little bit of insight here. The the issue with putting those types of devices in the brain is that the tissue becomes inflamed. And when you get inflammation in the brain, it's not good long term. So there is a company called Synchron, which I am an investor in, and um, they have a senoid, which is about half the size of your pinky, and it's a mesh metal wire that goes into an artery. And that feeds in real time the pulses from your brain waves and the information into devices around you. And there's six humans right now on the planet that have this and are functioning. Now, these humans are, you know, they have um, it's a little physical. Scary. I don't know about it. Yeah, one yeah, of them yeah. at the table right now. <laughs> <laughs> I probably will be one of the last people to get. Maybe yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, it's like, I, like for me, it's like the it's like the Elon um, mindset. It's like. I'll build the rocket, but I won't get on it. You know, right, like right. Elon's like, yo, because when they ask him, they're like, hey, are you going to be the first one to go to Mars? He's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, my goal and uh, I see this future and I was so excited to invest in Synchron because I wanted the opportunity to sit with Tom Oxley, the founder, and really give him the download on how powerful blo- blockchain technology is and how he can use that to empower the owner around the software and the data and the information. Because think about all the data that's being collected right now by our devices. It's not collecting, well, now we are because we have cameras around us. But right. but when there's not, in, you know, there are a lot of data points that are not being collected. Um, or even, you know, we get to NFC chipped clothing, but like the designer that I'm wearing doesn't know that I'm wearing it for this show and they don't know how many people will see it. But there are all these post-sale data analytics that you'll be able to collect from things. And the same thing with brain computer interfaces. You'll be able to collect a lot of information about a person. Yo, this is kind of, this like reminds me of like uh in uh minority report uh with Tom Cruise. I don't know if, has anybody ever watched that film like where you can actually like so but predict the things and like this and that and like when you walk in they scan your eye and they welcome you and they cater ads to you in particularly. Well I wanted to ask you because, as you know, um, I'm incredibly spiritual. Like my faith in God is incredibly important. I'm like, I am a human element maxi, right? Like I, like as sober as it can get. Like I'm, I'm a, like I will always bet on the human element. One of my concerns on these brain computer interfaces, right? And I think we can bring it back to Web3 and like uh, the blockchain elements. It's not so much the output of the signaling that's going out. But can we talk about the dangers of the inputs, right? Can a com- As much as it can tell us, brain-computer interfaces can tell us what's going on in our bodies. Mm-hmm. I know you and I have touched base on this uh, in private conversations. So um, what are the dangers or the risks of being able to program instead of just pouring out data? Is there an opportunity or is there a danger where a company, an individual, a corporation can actually start programming 
data into the brain. Yeah, it is a risk. Um, they can do this. I'm not sure if all, so right now there's Synchron, BlackRock Neurotech, which is not associated to the private equity uh, company, but BlackRock Neurotech and then, um, you know, Neuralink. Um, but from what I understand, uh, they can input information into your brain. Now, there could be a, a positive side to that, an upside, which is helping to balance um, hormones or, you know, um, emotion, emotional states. Can they states. teach me, like, karate? Like, you know, like, I'm thinking of, like, I'm like, 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 Hey, listen, they're documentaries, people. They're documentaries, all right? Like. Yeah. Um, it is possible. And, you know, I, I think it'll come down to the integrity of the founders mm -hmm. and how they're able to maneuver. I mean, this is untreaded territory that we're getting right. I'm excited. It's like we're literally getting to, you know, Christopher Columbus got to go out and discover and um, explore new land. We're getting to do that in our space. Mm -hmm. We're getting to do that in the digital with hardware and software. And that's what this all is. It's a big exploration and it's really finding good people and helping to also be a light for them too, to show them, hey, you know, uh, we can empower the user um, or the owner of the chip to have to own their own data and to give permissions of what they want and what they don't want, um, and to not let let it become something where humans are being controlled. You know, we have this big fear around AI. Once AI gets in there, well, then who knows? You know, if AI is controlling the chip and it's not a human, but then it comes down to you know who's programming. The AI. You look at um, OpenAI with what Sam Altman is doing with WorldCoin. I mean, that's a little scary because uh, from the, the pitch that I've heard is that AI is going to want to compete with humans to make money. Yeah. Right. Well, why is AI being programmed to want to make money? Yeah. Why can't we program AI and say don't make, don't have the desire to make money? Don't try to generate any sort of form of value. Why not? But that's not what they're doing. They're programming it to want to compete with humans so that they can leverage that right. and... Because it reflects the desires of humans. Right? Yeah, but yeah. then also, you know, then you put humans in a position where they need to be, you know, it's creating a case for universal basic income mm -hmm. under well, something called WorldCoin. So Sam has always been a, a big advocate against capitalism. You know, like there's... Which a very strange. You get, which is very, very strange, right? But he's like... Um, I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate, so I don't know if I can say it like with certainty, but I've read like whether it's tweet threads or like excerpts of articles where he really wants to have AI uh, challenge capitalism, mm -hmm. right? If not, if, not, uh, if not attack it, challenge it. And so that's very concerning as well, right? And like the proof of human is something that is really concerning as well, right? Like our sovereignty is gonna be centralized and so what I want to chat, because like there's a difference between, there's a big stark philosophical difference, right? Because like AI requires a significant amount of centralization, right? Big data sets, LLMs, making sure that there's data models that they can train them on. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, it's like we're training our adversary, like, hey, here, <laughs> here, this is what we're doing, right? And blockchain, the philosophy of blockchain is completely about sovereignty and decentralization and trustless most systems, it. most of it. So right? there is a nuance there where people don't understand too. I, I meet teams all the time that are like, oh, we're using Flow. And I'm like, do you, do you understand how Flow works? Because it's not a decentralized blockchain. Mm -hmm. So there is that disconnect and nuance between how people are educated on what a block, because a blockchain can be centralized, it can be distributed, or it can be completely decentralized. Um, so really understanding and knowing that. And they say, you know, we didn't read the T's and C's in web two. Mm -hmm. Are we going to read them in web three? Right. And are we going to read them when we get chips put into us? Are we going to read them when we're using open AI? Cause it doesn't look like it. I, I, I didn't <laughs> read it. Yeah. 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 But yeah. sign me up, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's, GPT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, that's what's sort of happening. So, you know, I think that these are the important conversations that we need to have now. If somebody's trying to challenge capitalism, well then what is their intention and where is the destination that they want to go? Because it sort of seems like, you know, creating an AI that wants to compete with humans to make money and then you're going to put humans in a situation where they need to all be supported by a universal basic income. You're creating dependent people that are dependent on a system mm -hmm. and not independent from the system and sovereign. And that's really the power of Bitcoin. We already have Bitcoin. We don't really need anything else. We can just use this. And um, I, I, one of the, we'll get to the 
you know, alpha and the trends that I'm following, but one is, is AI on chain mm -hmm. and everything on chain and being able to generate things on chain, not only for purposes of, you know, when you create something right now, um, on mid journey, you can put, you know, Elon Musk next to 10 girls and say, Oh, he was seen with all these girls today. This is strange. But really, where was that? Where did that come from? Did it come from him, or did it come right. from a photographer? Or what, you know, so really being able to prove the chain of this is my plug for tokenized media. Yep. I'm just gonna put that <laughs> out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say it if you did. <laughs> but the exact same thing. I mean, yeah. exactly what you guys are doing. It's in mm -hmm. alignment with those with that ethos, and mm -hmm. I think it's gonna be as we increasingly become more dematerialized and more disrupted in our technological devices and software, we're going to need things on chain. And that's what's been really exciting in my journey is that I got in so early and I'm starting to see all of it come alive um, and, a, and real use cases for the technology. Um, so it's, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, let's get into the alpha. I want to hear some right. more trends that you're, that you're no, identifying. But like, that you're but not only that, but like before we go into the trends, like yeah. I need to set some context for our audience okay. here and our community. Set the stage. I'm going to set the stage. So Megan, if I'm not, if I'm not incorrect, you were one, if not the first human to wear a digital fashion piece on live TV. Yes. And then you were also. I worked, it was an NFT. It was so an I NFT, had, right? I had three NFTs on Yahoo Finance segment in October 2021 um, with DressX. So I took, it was so nice. Um, Zach Guzman was on um, Yahoo Finance and he said, you know, I, I was at the time going on and talking about crypto and the asset class and um, doing some price calls, which turned out to be great. And I said, Zach, I really want to spotlight digital fashion as a, an investment opportunity. And he was like, what, what are you talking? So I, I, it took me months actually to, to get him to agree to it and, and his producers. And, um, they, they brought us on, I showed, you know, how it works. And I had, we had minted them on chain. They put them on OpenSea, and, uh, I had three pieces that I was wearing as NFTs and I own them. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it was the first human to wear NFT digital Sounds fashion. Like historic digital historic garments. Right. Yeah. Digital, digital yeah. garments. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second one, yeah. we have it here on the studio. So for everyone listening, but not on video, I'm holding the Miami Hot Living uh, cover where Megan Casper is on the cover of it. I'm going to put it here on the camera so everybody can check it out. Let's talk about this cover. Yeah. And the significance of it. That digital Fendi. So Fendi let us use nine pieces um, that were available on their website to purchase and we digitized them. I wasn't wearing this obviously in the shoot and uh, dress X uh, superimposed and overlaid the digital version of the outfits onto me. And I think they did a, a really amazing job. And, and this is the first um, example of a human wearing um, luxury fashion on the cover of a magazine in the world. So it's very exciting. So we needed to provide that context before, before we yeah. actually go into also, the trends. When, we also, I just wanted to when share. When Megan talks trends, we listen. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really cool, easy way for, for advertising, marketing. And we did, you know, a QR code. And that QR code allows you to AR try on this dress. Oh, amazing. Using That's wonderful. Using the Dress X. Listen, let's, let's do this. Let's show yeah. this to the camera right here really quickly. Boom. So we have the QR code right here. You can do it here. And like. What are some other trends like Matt coming back to Matt's original question? What are some trends that you are a called out B are seeing in real time and C what's the alpha what's yeah, coming? We want the alpha. Mm -hmm. so, so capitalizing on early trends in crypto is the best way to make a hundred X or more. Um, and obviously this is not financial advice. Um, just the way that we sort of look at, uh, investments in first light. Um, there are five right now that I'm focused on. I'll share two, maybe three. Um, but the first one is, um, RWAs. So real world assets on chain, and that also encompasses fashion. So physical fashion, networked products or connected products tied from the physical to the digital on chain. Now that may give you another ability to wear it in different, you know, forms, whether it's AR or VR, um, or something like what we did here with the hot living cover. Um, but fashion is one of those real world assets on chain. Others could be, you know, real estate, um, vehicles, 
there's, you know, many different things that you could have, um, watches, accessories, jewelry. Uh, so that's one. The next is wallets. So I've watched different iterations of wallets evolve over the last 12 years. And I think in the next two years, we're going to see more, um, evolution and like a a better version of what a wallet is than we have in the last 12. Uh, Wallets are really important. So in web two, we have these centralized accounts that we go on to silo different entities. Like if we go into our Gmail account or go into our, you know, uh, Instagram, and some of them allow you to use, you know, your Gmail to log in. Uh, But the next version of that is the wallet and it's, it's, you know, connect wallet instead of login. And then, you know, we all know here, but most people don't is that you can have all of your data and information, not just your NFTs and your fungible tokens, but you can then actually own every single action that you take on a web browser through your wallet. And that can all be on chain. And then you can be compensated for that directly. So those sort of business models are really exciting and we won't get there until we have, you know, the majority of netizens, people that are using, we're all, you know, living pretty much full time in physical, but with the digital reality tied to us and connected to us. I don't know. How, have you guys checked how many hours a day you? Oh, dude. It's too many. Like, <laughs> it's shocking. Some, I look at yeah, it and it's like, 19. I'm like, there's only 24 hours in yeah, a day. Like, so in, okay, how I, is that possible? Let's, uh, I'm going to check mine right now. By right now. Let me see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's check it out. I feel like okay. you're probably even better than me. You know? yeah, I don't want to check All right. So right now on my daily average this week is six hours and 51 minutes oh, wow. it's 50 percent up because of the nft nyc you know the conference all right let's check oh, all right do I? I don't even know where to go. <laughs> let's go I try to let's keep go. this out of my uh yeah. mine's down to mine's only like five hours but it's down 43 percent let's of, go yeah, like you know this is, a, this is this is a week where we're bouncing around we're all over the place yeah know? like okay so oh wow this week has been way better yeah wow. six hours average Damn. daily average Look at nice. us. last week was uh 12 hours Whoa. Yeah, that sounds sounds like it. Yeah. 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 So so I've had weeks where it's been 18, 19, and I'm in shock. I'm like, how is this possible? What am I doing? Where did I go? (laughs) That's so crazy. But I go into rabbit hole deep dives for for I mean, I'm working 24 hours a day. So my whole life revolves around work. That's all I do because I love what I do. There's no work life balance. There's only harmony. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. That's really so awesome. wow, I'm really impressed. I'm glad we checked that out. So I went from 12 hours last week to look at that six hours and 28 minutes daily average. Let's this week. go. Yeah. yeah. Who knew? Conference weeks. Yeah. Hey, IRL. So, somewhat healthy for you. Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 it's like offsetting the good for the bad. Yeah. Um, but I was shifting gears here. Uh, because I want to come back to mental health. I want to come back to spirituality in a little bit, but and go ahead. Alpha. We need to oh, do Yeah, we're talking about that third one. Yeah. I want that third one. She, we... well, <laughs> she thought she could get, did get away with this, huh? She thought she could get away with this. We did touch on it though. We did. Um, it's AI on chain. Got okay. it. So having AI on chain, I think is extremely important. And I'm focused on many different projects in the space that are ushering in tech where it's AI on chain. And for me, you know, I spent I our allocation of capital is 80% in digital assets Mm -hmm. and 20% in equity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really push all of my founders to do token warrants for, or for token warrants for um, future tokens Mm -hmm. um, tied to the equity Mm -hmm. in whatever form they feel comfortable or whatever is right for each round. But I think that it's really important because I do truly believe that all the world's assets will be tokenized. Yeah. That's the kindest way of saying, Hey, I need my tokens. (laughs) <laughs> no, but, no, it's really, it's really not about it's, it's, it, for me, it's the best interest of the, mm-hmm. looking out for the best interest in the company, because I think that, um, equity will be tokenized. We'll have security tokens 100%. soon and there will be different forms of tokens. And it's not even, you know, there's many companies that are like, I don't even see us. It's like, maybe today you don't even see a use case for a token and maybe in 10 years from now you will. And I think that that's really important. And it's not so much about me. It's more about, planting the seed in their heads Mm. to getting them to think about using the technology in a way that can be really disruptive. I mean, look what you guys are doing at NFT now. It's so impressive. And being able to take a technology and apply it to an old, antiquated sort of dinosaur industry that's inefficient and make it work better, that's what the technology is here to do. So for me, it's not really about getting the tokens. It's about um, empowering 
and planting the seed because mm. a lot of people aren't ready for it yet. Like you guys are super progressive and you're on it and you know, and you're seeing it and living and breathing it. But there are a lot of companies, especially in digital fashion that I'm investing in and they don't understand it yet. Mm. And they're like, Megan, we're just not there. And it's like, it's okay. You don't have to be. But I think in the future you will be. You don't know where you'll be in three years. There's, wow, what happens within a three-year time period in tech and crypto is so fast. And you don't know what's going to be available in the next three years on chain, you know? Yeah. What, so, what's, the, what's the same at that you say? What's the weeks or the months, months? Or yeah, Web3, I always say weeks or months and months or years. The space yeah. moves really fast. Really fast. Yeah. All right, look, I want to get into this really quickly because I want to get into this alpha. But <laughs> let's talk about... Um, the thing that always consistently and historically outlasts recessions and bear markets, which is the luxury market, yep. mm. right? The luxury market uh, historically, right? When there is a recession, they still like LVMH has the seen harbor, the rides right? like the safe harbor, yeah. these things. Like I think LVMH during 2008 to 2010, like saw an actually an increase in revenue and things of that nature from that capacity, right? Right now I read, I'm a car fanatic, as you guys know, of Formula One. Um, Ferrari right now has more inbound interest for future cars that the wait list is actually going for. Um, there's, it's getting longer and longer. So let's talk about the Couture fashion houses and most of them starting to take Web3 and digital fashion very real. What are you seeing? Who are the players and what's currently happening? Well, it's really exciting that the brands are embracing this shift. Um, we're seeing, you know, I, I always, we, we talked about this, I'll put Artifact aside because to me, they are a native Web3 brand that really trailblazed the path for all of these other brands to come in and get excited. Um, the Nike acquisition, I don't think makes them a high-end luxury brand yet. I, that's not to say that they wouldn't be in the future. Um, but I think as of now, I sort of put them in their own category. Um, but looking specifically at brands like Dolce & Gabbana, Valentino, Chanel, Prada, Fendi, the, the main core luxury fashion houses have been very quick to embrace education around Web3 and maybe not so quick to rush out and copy the Web3 native initiatives like Artifact or like 90CC or like Colton Rain. And these brands are sort of experimenting, showing the traditional brands what is possible. And I also think at the same, simultaneously, there are new brands that are going to be up and coming that may replace the old brands. Not to say that those brands won't exist. Um, I, you know, I think Chanel will exist for a very long time. And with the disruption of the physical to the digital, you know, I think we're moving from owning something physically first to owning something uh, digitally first. And there are many different, you know, steps along that incremental shift. And as we're moving into that reality or it more into that realm where we're buying things digitally first, um, brands like Dolce & Gabbana doing the nine piece couture items. Collection, Collection Genesee was the first in the world, uh, couture collection to be tokenized. Um, they did some purely digital items. So we own two jackets that are purely digital at Red Dow. And then we have the Doge crown which is digital and physical. Mm -hmm. And that crown is to date the most expensive uh, fashion NFT that exists. It was purchased for 423 ETH, which at the time was over a million dollars. Now it's, you know, collapsed a little bit, the price of ETH. But um, yeah, it's, it's still to date the most expensive. And at Red, we were really excited about this acquisition because it marked a moment in time in a piece of history where the fashion industry entered, the traditional luxury fashion industry entered crypto and entered Web3. So for our readers uh, and our community and our audience here, um, can you give a little bit of context of what Red is, what Red Dow is? Because Red is Red Dow. I'd um, love to get some context on that and the importance of it. So Red Dow was started by a collection of, I would say it was sort of incubated from an idea um, from Flamingo um, and from Flamingo Dow. Um, there are 45 founding members and we all got together and decided, you know, we wanted to create a Dow to help proliferate and push the narrative of digital fashion. 
and support it by purchasing and collecting and um, buying into projects that are uh, all digital fashion focused and supporting founders too. So, you know, we're, there are many projects like UNXD and the Fabricant and DressX that we've invested in. Um, so in, in pretty much every dimension that we can help support the ecosystem, we are. And that's the mission for Red Dow. Um, so we all sort of got together and the first purchase that we had voted on was the purchase of the crown and we won the auction. And, um, yeah, from there, it's just been, a, a great, almost what, two years now. Um, and we're slowly adding people so we can have up to 99 members in the Dow because of our legal structure. So what's interesting about the Dow, um, I'll give you a little insight into how this works. Um, it's not a complete decentralized autonomous organization in the structure. So it is a Delaware LLC, and that's why we're only able to have up to 99 members. And I really like the structure because it it we're in the old world and we're in the new. Like we're sort of balanced between both. And it's really showing, and, and it's a great, all of the tribute labs, DAOs, I think, are a great example of how you can still uh, stay in a regulated environment and do things properly and also use decentralized technology to be more efficient, um, and enable trust and transparency. So all of us members didn't really know each other and we came together, pulled capital and all of our voting on decisions that Dow, um, executes happens according to the weighted percentage of your capital contribution. And we can all trust that because it's all done on chain through the wallet that you initially in. Invested. Yeah. yeah. Put your shout shout out to Aaron and Pre. They've, they've, yeah. they've been really at the Consistent. forefront of the consistently Consistent. on this. Um, let's talk about a little bit of these projects and who, the founders who are behind them. Uh, Sashi, a fellow NFT, yeah. uh, NFT 100 Plus honoree. Uh, team, yeah. Let, let, um, also, also NFT 100. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. let's chat about these, these companies and Maybe you can transition us into a little bit of alpha. Yeah, for Let's sure. Let's do it. So I'm, but for me, UNXD has been one of the most exciting because I'm, so red covers uh, the entire spectrum of, of fashion and digital fashion from high-end luxury fashion being tokenized, physical products or physically and digital, all the way down to the more metaverse, fantastical um, wearables in fashion. So if you look at something like Tribute, tribute brand, mm -hmm. incredible high quality, photorealistic, but very more metaverse and and things that maybe the physical reality would limit you in creating. You wouldn't be able to actually have those items. Um, and they're super beautiful. So we do all of that. And I, I'm, you know, big fan of digital fashion. So, you know, I'm happy to support all of it, but my real passion is for luxury and high-end fashion. And the one person who's, who sort of ushered this vertical uh, in the sector has been Shashi Menon and Nick uh, at UNXD. And they have an impressive background. They took um, Vogue to Saudi Arabia or to the Middle East, and they have Vogue Arabia and also Wired. So they were really ingrained into the traditional fashion industry previous prior to their exposure to the blockchain and crypto. And um, yeah, in 2021, they launched the first project, which was the Collection Genesee. And since then, they've done the box drop with, with Dolce & Gabbana. Um, they've done some things with Jacob & Co., which are really beautiful and fantastic watches. Um, they now have an exclusive with Valentino. And that is some really exciting yes. alpha. <laughs> Excited. I'm excited about that one. So, yeah, about that. yeah. You know, we do have a little history with Jacob and Co. Too. I gotta, yeah. I gotta. Uh, what is it? Is it this one? Yeah, Jacob designed yeah. these for oh, us. Oh wow! The three of three. <laughs> the three of three. Yeah, yeah. So he, Incredible. Yeah, did you did tokenize them, them too? Uh, not yet. We should we actually. Should. Hey, yeah. you know, maybe we should. Hey, yeah. We should, uh, Real world speak. assets. There it is. Yeah. I mean, you should get them on UNXD. That would be cool. That would be kind of cool. Yeah. yeah we'll figure it out. We'll see yeah. what we could do there. That's um, so neat. You know, before the podcast, we were speaking about a little bit of the, we've been celebrating a lot of the digital fashion, you know, yeah. and I think it, um, I'd love to invite you to see the opposite side of the coin. Mm -hmm. Where can digital fashion and Web3 really improve? What are some of the things that that need to be criticized a little bit? You know, what are the, the areas that we can poke holes into? Yeah. Yep. 
um, the use case, right? Like when you buy digital fashion now, what are you buying? What are you doing with it? Um, if you're a fan as a collector, cool. Um, are you buying it as a speculative asset? That's really been, you know, there's 15 different use cases for digital fashion and the biggest has been speculation. Mm. And that's like pretty much the trend and theme that we see across the entire uh, NFT ecosystem. And I think that we're going to see um, a reemergence and an evolution around how NFTs are being used. I don't even know if we'll call them NFTs in the future. It'll just be on-chain real-world assets. Um, and I don't think people will buy things just as speculation. But right now, you're not going to buy something to use it because where are you going to use it? You can't use it on Instagram to create you know, social media posts, which I think we will be able to in the future, or any social media platform or social reality. Um, we're just not there yet. We're, di- we're still in science experiment mode and phase. And once we get there, we'll look back and say, okay, now I know what all this was for. Um, same thing, you know, I look back at the ICO phase and I was so excited. I mean, that was such an exciting time for me too. And, and now it makes sense as to why all of that happened and where that's going to take us in tokenizing um, equity and, and having securities on chain um, and getting us to a place where, you know, real value can be put inside of a smart contract. So there's some AR features and functions, but AR, let's be honest, it's not great. And it's not something that the masses are going to use right now. Um, But we'll get there and have in real time um, applications Mm -hmm. where we can, maybe AI can immediately dress us Um, or, you know, chips, chip. This is, you know, we're, we're seeing the nascent early versions of chipped items. I actually put my phone yesterday on top of my Rimois suitcase and an NFC notification popped up and took me to the website to be able to give them my information as I own the item. Wow. And I didn't know that. I didn't, I'm going to yeah, go home and like, <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. I, I just had set my phone down on it and I thought, what is this? Um, so we're definitely getting to a place where item IOT, right? Mm-hmm. Everything is going to talk to each yeah, other. Where all of so. our things are going to be, it's ownership. We're really shifting from um, web two being a consumer to web three being an owner and being able to prove that ownership. And that comes along with like, you know, G money was the first to really show what the digital flex can do. And I think we're going to see an entire new environment. I've never seen more people scanning t-shirts in my life. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. You know, one thing too, you know, we at NFT Now, our mission has always been empower the creators of culture and bring this technology from niche to mainstream. One of the reasons why we're so excited about digital fashion is its potential to really take this technology mainstream and and bring it to people who maybe aren't plugged into the space right now. That's one of the reasons why we launched the runway column uh, focused on digital fashion. I would love to hear from your perspective on that bleeding edge. What is it going to take to bring digital fashion mainstream? Uh, well, wallets for one. If, if we talk about digital fashion on chain, which is where I think we're going, um, we're going to have to have way better wallets, easy UI and UX. Everyone's aware of that. Uh, and we'll get there. And then also, I think that we're going to get away from this more metaverse fashion-y type of reality. And it'll be something like what Katie and James did with Soil during Metaverse Fashion Week. It'll be this very hyper photorealistic beautiful experience where it looks like you're in physical reality. And that's when you're on a web browser. So it'll just be an upgraded, more enhanced version of a web browser experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, once we have, hopefully in the next three or four years, a device disruption from the handheld to a near eye wearable, then we'll really get to see what digital fashion offers us. And I think that's really where the mainstream is going to pick it up. Let's talk about the metaverse fashion in Decentral Amp. I want to bring this. <laughs> you wanted me to be critical, didn't you? Uh, you know, we, we we have to be fair. You know what I mean? We ha- we do have to address the good and the bad. You yeah, know, the like, market where it is. That's yeah. really it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? End of March this year. It was a flop. So it wasn't as successful as last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was partially because, to be fair. Um, there was not a lot of marketing done around Metaverse Fashion Week. Not a lot of people were aware that it was happening or going on. Um, I didn't see a lot of marketing and we see everything. Um, so I think that that, had, that contributed a lot to the fact that there weren't very many people participating. But also, why? Why would you go into Decentraland? And why would you go into any of these platforms for Metaverse Fashion Week? What is it? Is there something for you to gain? People do things because they're incentivized and they're they're gaining some value from it. 
And at this point, there's really no value, if we're going to be honest, for them to gain. It's it's a cool, fun marketing tool and activation. But when it comes to an actual product channel or an actual experience for people to have and gain value from, it's not quite there yet. So when we look at um, gaming and uh, play to earn, people can go in and create value for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they're incentivized because they're able to earn something. Um, The two earn economy, we've had the conversation, I think we're going from a creator economy to a two earn economy. And I think that um, people are going to be incentivized more and more to do things and compensated on chain for those actions. And that's not yet implemented or wasn't at all in Metaverse Fashion Week. Um, But I think that the evolution of fashion will become digital and physical, and we won't call it metaverse fashion week. It'll just be, you know, fashion brands creating physical and digital at the same time experiences and using the technology as a tool to improve and enhance, um, that event. That's really awesome. And I appreciate the candid feedback here. Of course. All right, let's bridge it. I want to bridge this into a little bit more personal right. and we're <laughs> just uh, coming up to a close uh, yeah. in, a, in a few, in a couple minutes, but you are an incredibly established and you create so many opportunities not only for yourself for others and very few people know that you are self-made you know what i mean like you've actually fought the fight have championed a lot of your own things um you know being a woman in the space is also something very real that needs to be addressed in that capacity i wanted to ask you a personal question um knowing what you know today what would be the advice if you were sitting across 20 year old you right now what would you say to her i would say go in harder (laughs) (laughs) much harder and don't you know i didn't i never gave up and i've always my entire life i've been told you can't do this you're not good enough you don't have enough resources you don't have you know just from every angle and i just choose not to believe it it's like that's that doesn't exist for me doesn't exist in my reality um there's always been you're too young or you're too old, or you're not good. There's always something. Mm -hmm. And I just choose to cut that off and say, I don't believe it. I just, I choose not to believe it. And same thing with, you know, crypto and being in crypto early. Um, Even now, you know, my, my parents and financial advisors, I keep 99% of my wealth and net worth in crypto. And they don't like that. They're like, you know, you need to diversify. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You need to have um, assets in other places. And I'm like, no, I don't because that's not what's right for me. And I'm going to do what's right for me. And, um, you know, kind of I didn't let the outside world tell me uh, how to shape and create the future reality that I wanted for myself. And, um, you know, I've been wrong about things, of course. I'm not right about everything. No one's but perfect. Yeah. I, I have a, a very harder. strong uh conviction for uh what i see and what i want that's that's amazing it's like drake says it's like right confidence is a stain they can't wipe off mm-hmm. right yeah, yeah and a- it grows it's it's like you know i don't think that i would have the confidence that i do today had i not gone through all of the hardships and difficulties that i had to face and the barriers and i've been through quite a few and you still show up super kind super curious and like super soft but it, not in a like soft way but like in a kind like nurturing way so i just wanted to highlight that on that front are you ready for bearish or bullish oh all right why don't we kick it off uh bullish or bearish 90 cc bullish all right i'm gonna bring one in because of the ar concept bullish or bearish snapchat Bearish. Bearish. Ooh, I disagree with you on that. Well, that's a different day for another <laughs> topic. Different day. Uh, bullish or bearish NFT now? Well, bullish, obviously. Well, wait, no, not NFT now. Ooh, <laughs> we gotta leave so- it right there. We gotta. Leave it. <laughs> the alpha is coming. The alpha. <laughs> the alpha is coming. The alpha is coming soon on that. But she's on to something, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Um, you asked. I had to do. Hey, it. no, listen. I, I would, one more. I got one more here. Uh, this is the most important one. Okay. okay. Like this is the defining moment of this. All right. Bullish or bearish? Medved's fashion choices. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, 
I mean, looking around at this space, I was so impressed when I walked in here. I was like, you guys are too cool for me. Like you have very cool things. Um, so I would be very bullish. I like how she changed it from my clothes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, it's a representation. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. To be no. able to put things in like place. I, I mean, I'm a refiner. I'm very mm. specific on like tiny details. And I think that that's the most important for the overall aesthetic of any brand or design is, you know, being able to have a good eye for things and put colors and things together in the right place. And yeah, just it's. Yeah. yeah shout out I to sam be, for helping yeah, to coordinate this and uh, design this space and yeah uh, shout out to um atomic form for those the yeah, screens you know absolutely. what i mean little by little Aaron for always holding it down always holding it down it's always better together well megan it's been an absolute pleasure having you and thank you so much for joining us any final words no i'm just you know really excited about what you guys are doing and um i can't wait to for the world to hear and see more about what nft now is going to become the energy and excitement is very mutual so very excited to go on this journey together thank you thanks guys thanks mom <laughs> there it is thanks, mom. <laughs> wow that was amazing i i could have easily spoken to her for another hour I'd or more like, yo like six easily like easily easily bring computer interfaces fashion pattern recognition i want to know what those two others were part two part two part two part two part two what stood out for you man man i just love the insight that she brings to the table she is very much focused on where the puck is going mm -hmm. she is not living in 2023 she is thinking 2033 already and i think <laughs> that like you see it when you speak to her and she and she is extremely passionate about the future of this technology and its intersection with culture that's why i think she's such a great fit for nft now in terms of alignment and vision when we speak to where is this going how do we take this main stream and what are the verticals and technologies that are going to do that for us i i couldn't agree more matt uh what stood out for me is her presence i you know when you when you're in the presence of somebody who has done the homework who consistently does everything with the focus of how can i help right how can i give how can i continue to create opportunities for others to prosper like that's just a recipe for winning and then you marry that with hard work intelligence compassion and natural grit absolutely and then just like if you sprinkle it in her sense of fashion is spot on amazing Yo, like, the, like, like the way she carries herself is just through and through an, an incredible human being so and i just her kindness married with her intelligence i just feel like she is supernatural i think she's superhuman she may or may not be an ai <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for tuning in. And any final words, Matt? Yeah, look, you know, uh, tune in each week. We are always bringing you the best when it comes to the NFT Now podcast. Be sure to leave us a review on your favorite platform of choice. We love the stars, five of them, if you, if you, uh, if you can spare. And uh, we will catch you again next week.